Homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Today's guided meditation continues on from the earlier session we conducted with the focus on having a dirty Dhamma practice. In this guided meditation we were looking at where we still can't see as we're practicing Dhamma, trying to manifest the Buddha's teachings, where we still go wrong. Whether it's with our Kalyanamittas, spiritual friends, our Dhamma teachers, fellow retreatants, in our Dhamma circles and Dhamma groups, and all the good things associated with Dhamma practice. So we remind ourselves why we are doing this meditation. We're not trying to become super clean, good people, although that may be part of the end result, but it's not the main reason. The main reason is because in order to progress on this path, to develop and manifest fully the teachings of the Buddha to clear the mind of things which are obstructing us from fully knowing and realizing what the Buddha means, what he actually taught. We have to abandon or rid ourselves of these smelly, filthy, nasty defilements. From the earlier meditation, we saw some of the areas where it creeps in, where we may not have looked before or persisted in trying to clean up. All of us have a way of sweeping things under the carpet, allowing things to fester, not owning up. So this meditation and the other one with a Dhamma focus is really our opportunity together to clean it up, to look where it's hard to look and to give all of ourselves a chance of being better Dhamma practitioners who join into Dhamma circles, Dhamma groups, maybe leading Dhamma sessions, teaching, wanting to teach. If we don't follow what the Buddha says, it's very hard for us to grow, to progress. And we are not suvacha. We're not easy to instruct. We're not easy to give feedback to. And we stagnate veer off the path, or we don't grow. So have this in mind as we go through the other parts of the Vatubhama Sutta, the other upakilesas, defilements, mental stains. Have that in mind. If there are examples that are painful, or they strike a chord, really look at it, really focus the attention of the meditation there within this guided meditation and outside this meditation. Think of it as a blessing 
to start to see what one can't or refuses to see. Think of it as removing the obstacles, removing the blocks. And if you take it in this way, the path starts to really unfold. There'll be gladness in the mind. The mind will exp experience great pleasure. The body will relax and become tranquil. And there'll be a deeper happiness. It's not Nibbana, but it's something that helps you to concentrate the mind. And from that place you can discern and realize truth from Buddha's teachings. So get comfortable, relax the mind, and let's begin. Let's examine the defilement of stinginess, macharyang. It can also be known as selfishness and protectiveness. And it's a quality of being unwilling to share with others. And Buddha gives us five types of stinginess for us to contemplate. There's a lot of measuring, labeling, splitting, dividing contained within stinginess. It's very much conditioned by what we consider me and mine. The first one is stinginess in gain, Laba Macharyang. It's where we're not willing to share what we've gained. And what we gain is usually a material thing. So from a Dhamma perspective, the way to think about this, the way to contemplate examples, and when we're offered things, whether as people in Dhamma circles, seniors, teachers, we're continually offered nice things, good things, helpful things. And it's when we're unwilling to share or we're unwilling to share beyond our preferences. So an example could be, we're on a retreat and certain things are offered to a selective group of people and that selective group of people might be the seniors or the teachers or organizers. And it's seen by other people more widely that that's been made available. And instead of putting it on the communal large table, it's taken away and it's only shared with those in that inner circle. And maybe after it's been half consumed, it's then been put out. 
for the rest of the people. But when it's seen like that, it's seen as this stinginess in gain. And when you're in that inner circle, you can't necessarily see that that's what's happened. But the people on the outside, for them, it feels very selfish and stingy, not open and generous. Another example is when you're teaching Dhamma and you're constantly being offered things. There was always a trap or propensity to receive it and not to share. And it's one of the things that the Buddha always emphasizes when it comes to teaching Dhamma. In order to continue to teach, the Buddha always encourages not to receive actually, not to submit to particularly three qualities, Lava Sakara Siloka. And Lava is actually one of those three things, this gain. It taints Dhamma teaching, Dhamma sharing. whether by perception or in reality. And we hear all these stories about religious groups, Dhamma groups, where teachers have fallen because of lava, because of this gain. In this meditation, it's not about making the determination for a teacher or for anybody, but it's for ourselves to contemplate where we sit when it comes to stinginess and gain. And we might be students or we might be teachers of the Dhamma. We need to look at it, where we are selfish with material gains. The other type of stinginess in gain is very petty. You see this a lot on retreats. People are always rushing to grab the good seats and never want to let them go, especially if it's a meditation retreat for many days. On the first day you see people racing to get to the front to have the prime seat in front of the teacher. And sometimes you even see people moving other people's things or feeling superior because they have that particular good seat. And then you see other people who don't do those sorts of things. It's not to say that they're better, but their attitude is not towards selfishness. They actually allow others, if they really need it, because they're older or need to be near the teacher, And they don't have that kind of grabbiness, stinginess towards getting the best seat, getting the closest seat. So think about whether those examples resonate or whether there are other ones that you haven't thought of before but fall into this category. The questions to ask are, when I gain something 
Am I selfish about it? Do I share material gains in Dhamma? Only according to my preferences. Do I only share material gains in Dhamma? Only with the people I like. Sometimes when we have preferences, or maybe most of the time, we are very selective about how we share those things. We might only want to share dana with certain sangha friends. We may only invite certain people to enjoy our material gains. We may only give to the teachers we like. And from a receiving perspective, even if a person says to us, this is only for you, I'm only giving it to you. It doesn't mean that it's only for you. In Dhamma, we try our best not to be stingy, not to have so many barriers and obstacles and exclusions and limitations. Do you know why? It's because of metta. Loving kindness gets blocked, severely blocked when we're stingy when we're selfish, when we exclude, limit, separate, divide. And stinginess is a real big part of that. We can't have metta when there is stinginess. Because metta means there are no boundaries, no separation, limitless, unconditional loving kindness. And so this first kind of stinginess is part of that, that obstruction, that obstacle, that obscuration from metta. It has this mean-hearted quality. It grasps, holds on to, mainly for ourselves or for people that we, we like, that we prefer. And so we set boundaries so other people don't enjoy what we've gained. So when it comes to stinginess in gain, know the texture of the mind. Know that it is heavy with 
excluding people, protecting what one has gained, limiting how we share. In our minds, it's a really good practice to actually offer it. Whatever we have gained, even in our minds, thinking about offering it to everyone. We may not necessarily do it in an actual sense, but in our minds, it's really good to simply offer it that no holds bar. In our minds, it's offered. It's offered to Buddha, it's offered to the Arahants, it's offered to all the people around us. Once we are able to do that, maybe slowly in practice it can actually happen. And doesn't that feel good? Doesn't it seem simpler? Isn't it less complicated when we freely give? We don't have to think about not this person, but those people. Only that teacher, not all of them. Not that Dhamma group, just my Dhamma group. It's so complicated when we're stingy like that. Then we have stinginess in abode, avasa, macharya. It's where we're protective of our, of, of our dwelling place. It's where we don't want to invite people over, don't want to share our living space with others. In relation to Dhamma, it may be that we don't want to open our homes in order to host Dhamma events. Maybe we think our space is not good enough or will be judged or all kinds of different reasons. And often with this kind of stinginess, we feel very justified in our reasoning. But then you see other people who open up their homes and they have very simple abodes, but yet they're willing to do so, to open up, to say everyone is welcome. It's true that judgment can be very harsh, even in Dhamma communities. And it doesn't mean by cleaning this that you have to simply open because you should. But in meditation, it offers the opportunity to examine what is really going on in the mind. Is there a defilement that is pervading the mind? It's not a competition whether you open your house or not. But it is somewhere to look at what the Buddha encourages when it comes to this mental defilement. If the need arises to share your abode, 
to share the facilities within your abode, your home. One needs to examine it in one's mind. So when it happens in practice, you can look at it with a more balanced view. Another example is when someone calls you because there's a retreat happening near your area or within easy access from where you live. And so they call you and say, can I come and stay? I want to go on that retreat, but I need to have a place to stay. Sometimes we say no, even though there's plenty of room. Because we don't particularly feel we're close to that person in Dhamma. Or we're worried about what they'll think, what they'll find out about us. Sometimes that's the way we think. But the end result is blocking, not sharing. Or we are actually hosting a Dhamma event. But you're very selective about who you invite. You worry about this person doesn't get along with that person or this person has a different view. And so when it comes to opening up your house, it gets very complicated within Dhamma circles. So think about some examples of your own where you get kind of stuck. You know, this stinginess and selfishness does eventually come to a decision. But within that decision, one gets very, very complicated and very stuck. What should I do? When there is unwillingness to share, there are always swirling thoughts of what should I do? What should I do? I need to think about that. Hmm. What should I do? The mind gets very heavy, very tight, very unwieldy. It's not a very happy place when it feels even compelled to be stingy, let alone wants to be stingy. In Dhamma, maybe we don't actually want to be stingy. And in the rest of our lives, we actually don't want to be stingy too. But all these complications of barriers, division, measuring, labeling, you can see the roots of these things, where they're conditioned. It makes it very, very difficult. And you can see why Buddha wants us to clean this up. It's a real obstruction, a real barrier, a real difficulty. How can you concentrate your mind when it's weighed down by all of this? The third kind of stinginess Buddha refers to as Kula Macharya. And that's in relation to family, clan, groups, all kinds of groups, all kinds of divisions. It can also be gender, race, preferences, ideology. It's all the lines that we divide into groups. It's also very relevant when it comes to Dhamma groups. You know, how we divide different kinds of practices, different kinds of teachings, 
different kinds of ideas around what Buddha means and strong preferences about how we should learn the Buddha's teachings and how we should manifest the Buddha's teachings. There can be a lot of stinginess around this and how we think about it as well in our own minds, the perception of who we think we are. At a mundane level, it's always about correcting dysfunctional elements and to practice the Dhamma better. But at a super mundane level, it's about not constructing all these preferences around self. Not grabbing to make a me and mine and to think it will last and to glorify and to indulge in it, becoming intoxicated in it. When it comes to our Dhamma messaging groups, when it comes to our Dhamma teachers, when it comes to how we practice, there can be a lot of stinginess when it comes to our attitudes and our practice in this way. We like certain things over other things. We like certain people over other people. You see that all the way through Theravada versus Mahayana versus Vajrayana. You see Sutta groups versus forest groups. Even in one country, you see the way different people segregate and divide. And then disagree. So we may not be able to change a lot of the things in practice. Maybe not at all, maybe not straight away. But if we want to overcome these things, we have to start somewhere. And the somewhere starts with ourselves and in our minds. When the mental defilement can be abandoned, then there's the opportunity to lead by example, to manifest. to manifest in the right way. But you have to own up to where one is actually stingy. And so some of these examples may be having very clear preferences towards certain Dhamma groups, Dhamma circles, and disliking and not wanting to share with certain other groups. It may be a certain preference around gender. You hear people say, I don't want to listen to a woman. I can't stand listening to women in Dhamma. Or you might hear, I don't like that group. I don't want to share this, 
thing with them. They don't practice well. They indulge in the wrong things. So I don't want to share. The thing that we miss is that by not sharing in Dhamma at times, all the time really, is that these people, even if they're not practicing well or they're different in how they um, view things and they may secretly indulge, but the thing is if they never connect with someone who is practicing well, how will they get better? And if you don't share with them, They don't get to connect. And it's a connection not to fight or squabble. It's a connection just to connect in goodness. What I find is that when we connect without stinginess, where there's the opposite, which is generosity, open borders, open heart, that's connecting in goodness. If we invite Dhamma friends, even those we don't like, Dhamma teachers, even those we don't like and have squabbles with. If we invite them for things where we are doing good, we connect in goodness. And that's a beautiful thing. There's much metta when we can do that. So look deeply into whether there is stinginess. It's not about forcing you to immediately change what happens in practice. That may happen later. But it's really important to look at it, to look at the examples where stinginess towards family and groups may exist. The fourth kind of stinginess is Vannamacharya, where we have stinginess towards our virtue, our reputation. It's a big thing in Dhamma circles, in Dhamma practice. We often want to project how good we are, how virtuous we are how we don't do naughty or bad things, how we don't break sila, how we don't have the kinds of speech that we're not meant to have. And we can become quite stingy or selfish around that, very protective of demonstrating, showing, displaying good reputation, good virtue, even when it's not true. But even if it is true, which for most of us it is, except when we breathe these defilements and then we manifest and speak and act accordingly, I think the real equalizer here that comes with honesty is really looking at this protectiveness of virtue and realizing by looking at mental stains in the Vatupama Sutta how wrong we are. We're not really that virtuous. For some of us, we're so far away from where the Buddha and the Arahants are. And it's not to get down about it. It's actually to see 
to know, to acknowledge. We need to know what is kusala and what is akusala. And then decide. And then know what it's like to abandon. That's the beauty about practicing Vatupama Sutta and very similar suttas. It's that digging, 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 looking at the past, looking at the present to see do I have this defilement? And when you see, you think, wow, I really do have this defilement. But then you have a choice. And the thing about all these defilements is they're all so heavy, so complicated, so measured, so mean hearted that you definitely don't want to see it in somebody else. Yet, when you know you have it, it just makes so much sense to decide not to breed that, to not to cultivate that. It also makes sense sometimes we tweak to why people don't like us. It's because of this kind of quality. Isn't that a blessing to know? Most of us, in a manifested sense, we don't like when we're not liked when people have problems with us, when there are difficulties like that. And we might say, oh, it doesn't matter. But deep inside there's hurt. Remember when we spoke about ill will? It comes from even being hurt, ignored, not listened to. And so when we know with quality like stinginess that we have it, or any of these qualities, maybe they are reasons why people don't like us, why people find us disagreeable, why they don't want to visit us, why they don't want to attend when we host something in Dhamma, when we speak about Dhamma. Maybe what is infusing what we say is all these defilements. And so it is unpalatable as it should be. We are not good messengers of Dhamma when it comes to speaking from a place of defilement. It's fragrant when it's the Buddha's words because it is free of defilement. It's free of me and mine, grasping, misapprehension. When you listen to people talking Dhamma that is infused with me and mine, In a mundane sense, it seems funny, but in a super mundane sense, it can be hurtful, it can be cruel, and you can see it's imbued with me and mine, this Atta quality. And stinginess has that root. Me and mine, only give to me and mine, only give to those I like, those I care about, those I love those who are willing to listen to me, only willing to share with those who are open to me, not willing to share with those who are not open to me. And why should they be open to you if you have this barrier? And when it comes to reputation and virtue, As much as we protect the good that we do, we need to look at what we hide in the not so good habits that we haven't overcome yet. That equalizes this stinginess. When we say, oh, we meditate this many hours a day, we go to this many retreats every year. We teach this many number of people. What is it saying about our reputation? And then when we cover up, this is how much TV I watch. This is how much frivolous speech I indulge in with people outside of Dhamma. 
This is how much I indulge in food when people can't see. This is, I read, you know, all these violent uh, books and watch violent uh, TV programs where nobody can see. The important thing is to actually really examine it in the meditation, to clean it in the meditation because it's hindering our Dhamma practice and it's creating false impressions on people. Honesty with our Kalyanamittas is important. Buddha never says, just pretend to be good, just show good. Buddha actually says that if we are Kalyanamitta, if we are Sapurisa, if we are Suvacha, is what Venerable Mahamogalana says, then we need to be able to be honest. A true person is someone who tells what is bad about one's practice to other people, not hide it. If someone asks, you tell, you tell, yes, I haven't overcome this yet, but I'm working with it. Buddha never says, just pretend and don't tell. And when it comes to good things, you lessen the good. That's what Buddha says. A Sapurisa is someone who Lessons says just a little about what is good, especially if someone asks. But with the bad habits and qualities that one is still practicing, Buddha says, tell it, tell all of it. So that's one of the things to bear in mind when you meditate on this stinginess towards reputation and virtue. The question to ask is how many of us would actually say our bad habits, bad qualities? Not many. The thought that comes to our mind is what if they use it against us? What if they label us for those things? And that's the protective nature of stinginess. Stinginess is protective of me and mine, of atta, of the self that is created to be good, to project, I'm a good person, I'm a good Dhamma practitioner, I'm a good Dhamma teacher. But all you're doing is using band-aids, never uprooting the root of these things. In fact, you are sabotaging. We are all sabotaging if we continue down this road. And it's good to look at that. And the final fifth kind of stinginess is Dhamma Macharya. Stinginess about Dhamma, about knowledge. This is a very complicated one for most of us, whether we know it or not.
It could be as simple as not wanting to share notes that we've taken on Dhamma. Like being in school and you don't want to share your notes. Same thing in Dhamma. That's a very simple example. It could also be about attainments and knowledge about how to attain. About explaining Dhamma to people. Maybe you're a good practitioner, but you either can't be bothered or unwilling to teach, to share that, but you have the ability to. It could be just wanting to be alone. It is also where we disagree. Where we're very protective of the way we understand Buddha's words, the way we understand how to practice Buddha's words. You see it sometimes in social media, messaging groups where people are disagreeing. And there's a sparring going on at the knowledge level, at the Dhamma level. You see it when people don't want to listen to each other about Dhamma. And it's a source of great hurt and pain. You see it amongst Dhamma teachers and sharers of Dhamma. That unwillingness to listen to each other. And it really begs the question, why don't you want to listen? Where is it coming from? If it's a language barrier, different story. But if it's a language that you can understand... You see this intolerance, a lack of generosity to want to listen to another person. Maybe that person is coming up, wanting to share but still making mistakes, maybe not as clear. Or maybe you can see comparisons with other existing teachers. But the really good example, whether you're teaching or not teaching, is being able to sit in a Dhamma circle and be able to listen to others without talking over each other. With genuine metta listening, not constructing as someone is talking. If we construct in our minds while another person is talking, that's the beginnings of stinginess. Or maybe more than the beginnings of stinginess because there is no metta to be able to listen to another person, to even give the person the opportunity to teach us. As we know from Venerable Mahamogalana, Having this stinginess, this macharya in general, makes us very difficult to teach. Duvacha. Makes sense. If we're always constructing, if we always come from a position that our dhamma is better, our knowledge is better, then how will we get along? How will we improve if someone wants to give us feedback or teach us something? Give us a different perspective, different angle. Roles also play a part in Dhamma. The role of the teacher can be a huge barrier. Where you won't accept Dhamma from anybody else. 
you won't even sometimes accept Dhamma from Buddha or the Arahants. This is the thing about Dhamma Macharya. We think that this Dhamma is ours, whether whatever role we have, but particularly with teachers and leaders of Dhamma groups. Sometimes, if not all the time, we may be operating from thinking that this Dhamma is ours, this Buddha Dhamma is ours. And we behave and speak in a way that is infused with that. In those moments, we forget where it came from where this teaching came from, where the freedom path came from. It's from the Buddha. The Buddha who was perfectly enlightened with no help from anybody else, who realized the truth and was able to teach a handful of leaves to us, who is said to be the perfect teacher of gods and humans. impeccable in conduct. The Buddha does not manifest things like stinginess in all its guises. It sees what comes down the line, the kamma that can ripen from this kind of mental action. If we follow through on stinginess, what happens even when it leads to verbal misdeeds and physical misdeeds out of stinginess, And so a really good thing is never to forget, this Dhamma is not ours. This Dhamma comes from Buddha, comes from the Arahants who are perfected. We are still cobbling our path together, veering off to the left and veering off to the right, getting pushed back on by Kalyanamitta, by good teachers. When we contemplate Dhamma Macharya, it's very good to ask ourselves the question, who do we think we are? And what is it we're practicing if there is this stinginess about Dhamma? People don't often like us if we're not listening, not acknowledging, not coming in harmony. And when our Dhamma circles, Dhamma groups fail or have difficulties time and time again, stinginess or macharyang, is really a huge component part of that. You can actually analyze the root of problems in Dhamma groups and with Dhamma friends and Dhamma circles just by looking at this quality of stinginess, not sharing, protecting. going wrong. We protect what we think our construction is. We construct this self based on lots of stinginess. And so we're always fearful of the construction falling apart because it's the best construction that we've got left, all of us particularly when you overcome sensual desire, sense objects, you're not interested in gross material form. And so you turn to Dhamma and you hold very tightly to Dhamma. And so Dhamma groups, Dhamma circles, Dhamma teachers, Dhamma friends, Kalyanamittas, 
they all become where we mainly inhabit. And so when we come when we become very protective of what we see as our Dhamma circles, our Dhamma friends, our Dhamma teachers, a lot of nastiness can come out. And the nastiness is to those who are not within our Dhamma circles, our Dhamma teachers, our Dhamma friends. When you look at it like that, you think, you have to think, why am I doing that? What am I manifesting? What am I breeding? How can my path develop like this? And how can people find me agreeable like this? The Buddha's path is the liberation path because it's like setting free all these prisoners. We are prisoners in these defilements and we want to set them free and we want to help others to set them free. We can't help others if we are like this. So we need to make a very strong intention, a very, very strong intention. And thinking about the Buddha's impeccable conduct and the Arahants who have perfected and freed themselves, when you think that they're ultimate place is non-harm, non-ill will and renunciation. That is the highest measure. And so we want to get as close as possible to that. And so we make a strong determination based on these noble qualities of the Buddha and the Arahants. We want to have an intention to see, to see what is covered. And when it comes to stinginess, we want to see all the ways we have in the past and we are in the present, abiding in one of the five, all of the five forms of stinginess. And when you lift off these bags and bags and bags of stinginess in the meditation, when you actually identify areas where there is stinginess across the five, there is a sense of relief in the mind with this honesty. I continuously say with honesty it lifts It's like there's a pressure pressing down on us when we have to be stingy, when it's our bad habit, our go-to place, and all our mental ruminations are patching it all together. And so when we're honest about all these areas where we are stingy or selfish or protective, then It lifts, the mind eases because it doesn't have to ruminate, it doesn't have to analyze, it doesn't have to measure, deliberate. It doesn't have to keep protecting this sense of self that is dysfunctional, that is not good for us or for anybody else. If we want Dhamma to flow, we need to flow. 
with more ease. We need to get out of this sense of self that we're constructing and holding on to, which is not what Buddha taught. We keep going to buy our agati, which is going bad through fear. It's under the Manosanchetana Ahara. which is the nutriment of mental volition. The perversion is always seeing things as me and mine and needing to protect it, to reconstruct it in that way. Rather than seeing it's a construction, there's no me and mine. And I don't need to go to fear all the time. It's okay if all these concepts are not fully understood. Just take what is useful in this guided meditation. The main thing is actually to see the defilement and then to make a choice to ease the mind. And then what are we left with? We're left with a mind that can be happy for others, that can include everyone, not just our preferences. It can open up where it needs to be open, particularly in Dhamma. And it's not protecting something that is just a construction. And we give full credit to Buddha. Stop taking it as ours. This is Buddha who laid this groundwork, who did all these amazing things, which now enable us to try to free ourselves. It said that the Arahants, The noble disciples of the Buddha do not take praise for themselves. They always give it to Buddha. And rightly so, when it comes to stinginess around Dhamma and knowledge, this is what we must do. And we have the ability also to have much metta, to cultivate much metta to those that we experience who have all these forms of stinginess. We need to be kind to them, but we need to also demonstrate that we are correcting our bad behaviours, our bad ideas around these things. And only in that way as a Dhamma community, being part of Dhamma groups and practitioners and teachers, that we can come together and overcome all these obstacles. So let's just take a few moments to experience freedom from stinginess. Where the mind is light, it's no longer analyzing, measuring, thinking. In the absence of stinginess, the mind can elevate. It has admitted all the wrongs. It no longer wants to practice stinginess for for it to fester in the mind. Allow the mind to be spacious, not constructing obstacles, boundaries.
allow the mind to be happy. No longer shackled to stinginess. Allow the gladness to permeate the mind. That we are following the Buddha's instructions. Allow the body to get tranquil. To relax. And feel the inner happiness, the pleasure. And if the mind concentrates, allow it to do so. As it's been just over an hour, it's probably a good place to stop. We can continue with the other upakilesas, the other mental stains, with a Dhamma focus at another time. And so let's share the blessings and the merit from our practice in doing this guided meditation and going deeper into this mental stain of stinginess or selfishness. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all sentient beings be happy. May they be well. May they be all be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem to all of you. May you be well.
பெறுவான் சரணாய்